great pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Oren Fix. Uh, Oren has been with us now for over three years now. Okay. And uh, Oren is the site PI for a uh, multi-center NIH-funded uh, Ameri- uh, acute liver failure study group, and um, he's done extremely well with the lead and roller for a couple of years now. Um, so Oren is going to talk about give us an update about what's new in acute liver failure. Oren. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much, Francis. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, let me open this up first. I've, I've converted to being a Mac user, so I'm, I'm losing all my PC skills, but hopefully this will work. Um, so again, thanks for the invitation. As, as Francis said, I'm the site principal investigator for the Acute Liver Failure Study Group, which is a multi-center study that's funded by the NIH. It's been funded uh, for over 13 years now, and we have funding through 2015. Um, so it's one of the longest-running cooperative studies uh, funded by the NIH. And we've learned quite a lot about acute liver failure uh, from collecting data, both clinical data and also serum, uh, tissue, uh, DNA, and urine. And we've made these tissues available, this information available to outside investigators who are interested in, in using our data to uh, do ancillary studies. And there's also, of course, studies that are ongoing by the, um, by the group itself. And one of the studies we recently completed was the NAC trial, where we showed uh, a potential survival benefit in patients getting N-acetylcysteine over placebo, even if their acute liver failure was from a non-acetaminophen cause. So that was our first clinical trial, and we're poised to uh, do a lot more clinical trials, and that's uh, part of what I want to talk about today. Uh, I do want to acknowledge Keith Anderson, who's from Osera Therapeutics. Uh, we're partnering with them to do a clinical trial that should be starting in the next few months. Uh, Laura James from the University of Arkansas, uh, who's also uh, one of the investigators that's uh, helping us to um, uh, move forward with diagnostic approaches to acute liver failure. And then William Lee, who's the lead principal investigator located at UT Southwestern, primarily for his uh, unending support for junior investigators like myself. So um, I included three uh, learning objectives in your handout, but I've added a, a fourth one. So uh, what I'm hoping you'll be able to do at the end of my talk is to describe uh, two new approaches, at least two, uh, to the management of acute liver failure that we're going to be implementing uh, at UCSF and also across the United States in the coming year. Um, hopefully you'll be able to di- uh, describe how the diagnosis of acetaminophen toxicity can be facilitated by a new point of care test that's in development. Uh, d- hopefully you'll be able to describe the effects of a new drug called ornithine phenylacetate on the level of circulating ammonia levels and this drug's potential to aid in the management of patients with acute liver failure. And then finally to describe how a checklist can assist in the management of acute liver failure. So just so we're all on the same page, acute liver failure is the sudden loss of hepatic function uh, characterized by coagulopathy and encephalopathy in a patient without a recognized pre-existing liver disease. And etiologies are variable, as you can see from this uh, pie chart here. These are uh, data from the acute liver failure study group that the vast majority of patients with acute liver failure in the United States uh, get their acute liver failure from acetaminophen overdose. Uh, and this is divided roughly in half between unintentional and intentional overdoses. Other very uh, large categories are autoimmune hepatitis, viral hepatitis, other drugs aside from acetaminophen. And then there's a pretty big uh, category that we call indeterminate when the diagnosis is never really established. And that accounts for about 15% of patients with acute liver failure. One of the problems with acetaminophen-related acute liver failure is that uh, patients are largely unaware of the risks of acetaminophen, and we, we see this all the time. Patients that are diagnosed with acetaminophen-induced acute liver failure almost always say they had no idea that acetaminophen could potentially be hepatotoxic. Uh, sometimes it's accidental when it's uh, ingested in combination with narcotics, uh, uh, and that's a pretty uh, common problem where patients take more and more of the narcotic because of uh, tolerance to the drug and in the process ingest a higher and higher level of a dose-dependent hepatotoxin. Uh, plasma acetaminophen concentrations are often undetectable by the time liver injury occurs, and so the diagnosis is, is in question at that point. And unintentional cases often present late when encephalopathy is already present, and then uh, it's very difficult to get an accurate history from these patients. Just to review the acetaminophen metabolism, just like a lot of drugs that are metabolized by the liver, 
the primary ways that acetaminophen is metabolized is through glu glucuronyl transferase and sulfur transferase into non-toxic uh, uh, intermediates. Uh, but uh, acetaminophen is also metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system into a toxic intermediate that we call NAPQI. And with sufficient uh, levels of glutathione in the liver, this is quickly metabolized into a non-toxic compo uh, compound called mercaptopuric acid. Uh, but when these processes are overwhelmed by large doses of acetaminophen, very quickly the normal pathways of the glucuronide and the sulfate pathways are, are overwhelmed, and a lot of the acetaminophen is sort of uh, put into the cytochrome P450 system, and the glutathione stores are quickly depleted, and this leads to an accumulation of NAPQI. NAPQI then covalently binds with uh, hepatocyte proteins and uh, produces what we call NAPQI protein adducts or acetaminophen protein adducts, and this is the compound that leads to hepatocyte necrosis. Uh, a study that was done uh, in 2006 by uh, Dr. Davern uh, and the rest of the key liver failure study group uh, took uh, patients from our, our group, the acute liver failure study group, that were known to have acetaminophen overdose-induced uh, acute liver failure and compared that to patients with, that were known to have other e etiologies of acute liver failure and looked at levels of acetaminophen protein adducts in those patients. And uh, this was done with a pretty complex process of what's called high-performance liquid chromatography. Um, so it was not clinically available. It still really isn't clinically available. Um, but the patients that were known to have acetaminophen overdoses, 100% of them had positive protein adducts. And these adducts are detectable sometimes more than seven days after the patients present to our study sites. So this is even longer than seven days after their ingestion. And the patients that had non-acetaminophen etiologies, 100% uh, of them had no uh, evidence of these protein adducts. So this was a test that had 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. Uh, what's more interesting is that they also looked at a, a a proportion of patients with indeterminate etiologies. These are patients where we didn't know uh, the, the expert uh, hepatologist who was taking care of these patients was not able to determine the etiology for acute liver failure. And in those patients that actually had positive protein adducts, uh, their acetaminophen level, protein adduct levels were about the same as those in patients that were known to have acetaminophen overdoses. And in those that had indeterminate uh, 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 that were indeterminate, who had negative protein adducts, uh, their levels were, uh, were negative. But I think what's more interesting about this population is that clinically the patients that had positive protein adducts but were indeterminate uh, had characteristics that were very similar to patients that were known to have acetaminophen overdose. So primarily female, relatively low bilirubin levels, very high AST and ALT levels, high INRs, uh, predominant, predominance of renal failure. So what we came out of this study was that a large proportion of patients that are indeterminate for etiology of acute liver failure actually have acetaminophen that's either the cause or at least contributing to the cause of their acute liver failure. And that proportion was close to 20%. And this speaks to uh, why it's very difficult to make diagnoses in these patients, particularly because they're encephalopathic by definition and, uh, and it's hard to get a history. So what we're about to embark on in the acute liver failure study group is a new way of detecting acetaminophen in these patients by use of a, a, a dipstick at the point of care uh, that can measure these acetaminophen protein addicts. This is not yet clinically available, but hopefully will be soon. So we're about to start a proof of concept study where a sample of blood from these patients will be sent to the central site in Arkansas where they'll undergo the standard high-performance liquid chromatography uh, analysis for acetaminophen protein addicts and also at the individual study sites, uh, dipstick will be performed where there'll be a visual ins inspection, either positive, negative, or indeterminate. And there's also an automated dipstick reader that can actually give you uh, a qu uh, quantitative uh, level. The medical team initially will be blinded to the assay results. So we won't be able to use this for clinical care right now, but hopefully this will bear out as something that's very useful and we'll be able to more quickly make the diagnosis of acetaminophen-induced uh, acute liver failure and also lower that uh, 15% indeterminate rate of, of etiologies. Uh, so moving on to uh, another category of what's coming out in acute liver failure uh, management, uh, for whatever etiology that causes acute liver failure, there are multiple complications. This is a very complex uh, process, and what we're most concerned about is intracranial hypertension, uh, leading to cerebral edema, cerebral herniation, but other things that we're concerned about that can cause uh, death or morbidity in the patient's infection and sepsis, bleeding because they're coagulopathic, renal failure is common, shock and cardiovascular collapse, hypoglycemia, and multi-organ system failure. 
And the most common cause of death in these patients is uh, intracranial hypertension leading to cerebral ischemia and uh, cerebral herniation. In the acute liver failure study group, outcomes are uh, still not that great, but much better than they've been, and we can account for uh, increases in uh, liver transplantation for these patients, improvements in ICU care, and also there seems to be a trend to more benign, uh, benign is a relative word in this term, but, but, but benign uh, etiology. So in our study group, we've seen about almost half of patients that spontaneously survive, meaning they don't need a transplant, but almost a quarter that undergo transplantation, and then another 28% who die without a transplant. And the three-week outcome, which is the standard outcome for our study, uh, we see an overall survival of about 70%. But what we notice is that even though uh, etiologies are sort of different in terms of uh, uh, different prognoses, so some etiologies are clearly associated with good prognoses. Acetaminophen is the best example. Certain etiologies are, are uniformly poor prognoses, and Wilson's disease is a good example of that. But no matter what the etiology, the uh, time at which the patient presents to, the, uh, to uh, a medical center, uh, whether they're in coma grade one or two versus coma grade three or four, really has a big impact on their prognosis. And part of that may be related to uh, late referrals and patients coming to us when they're already in grade three or four encephalopathy. The other part is that some of the um, more hyperacute uh, acute liver failures, these patients progress very quickly, and by the time they get to a medical center, they're already at grade three and four encephalopathy. But across the board, no matter what the etiology, if you present early in grade one or two, uh, then you have about a 50% better survival uh, than if you present in grade three or four. And this is uh, directly related to some of those things that we worry about, particularly uh, uh, intracranial hypertension, cerebral edema. We know that ammonia is central to uh, the development of uh, hepatic encephalopathy, both in chronic liver disease and in acute liver failure. It's probably... Uh, much more uh, relevant in acute liver failure. Um, and we know that in chronic liver disease, we don't tend to follow ammonia levels. Uh, we, we see a lot of other things that, uh, that um, impact on patients' uh, altered mental status in that setting. Um, and it's not often something that, uh, although it leads to a lot of hospitalization, is not something that often immediately leads to death of the patient. This is different in acute liver failure, where ammonia is directly related to hepatic encephalopathy, intracranial hypertension, uh, cerebral herniation. And uh, just to go over some of the mechanisms of why this is uh, a problem in acute liver failure, uh, the source of ammonia is primarily from the gut, from the action of glutaminase, uh, acting on glutamine to form glutamate and ammonia. And uh, the ammonia is really the problem, uh, at least that we believe, in, in terms of leading to uh, cerebral edema and intracranial hypertension. But there are other ways that the ammonia can be detoxified in, in the liver and also in skeletal muscle. So in the liver, it's actually primarily the urea cycle that detoxifies ammonia. Um, but when the liver is not functioning, such as in acute liver failure or in chronic liver disease, uh, then uh, those, that, that is not really an option. The urea cycle is not really useful. And then you rely on uh, skeletal muscle to detoxify ammonia by converting glutamate into glutamine using uh, glutamine synthase. And the other source of glutamine synthase in the body is in astrocytes in the brain. And there's various uh, theories about why this is a problem. Uh, it may be that, that um, uh, glutamine actually causes uh, osmotic problems in the brain. I think I have a picture of a brain there. Um, uh, causes osmotic problems in the brain, leading to astrocyte swelling. Um, and uh, it also may be that it's actually just a direct mitochondrial toxin leading to power failure uh, in the astrocytes. This is just a schematic of what's happening. So ammonia primarily from the gut combines with glutamate to form glutamine uh, with the action of glutam glutamine synthetase. And in chronic liver failure, the astrocytes are actually able to co compensate for this by exporting organic osmolites and avoiding some of the uh, volume problems that we see in acute liver failure. But even so, there's some uh, sort of functional problems with the astrocytes leading to abnormal neurotransmission, and this probably accounts for hepatic encephalopathy in that population. In acute liver failure, the production of ammonia or the, the accumulation of ammonia is so quick that these uh, comp compensatory mechanisms are overwhelmed, and this leads to astrocyte swelling. And in combination with the problems that we see in, in chronic liver disease, you get not only hepatic encephalopathy, but cerebral edema as well. We don't see cerebral edema that often in uh, chronic liver disease. Um, it's been reported to happen and, and also to lead to the death of the patient, but that's pretty rare. Uh, whereas in acute liver failure, that's a pretty common problem.
Uh, so one of the things we need to do is to try to lower the ammonia levels uh, in, in the circulation to try to prevent this problem in acute liver failure. Um, and we know that ammonia is directly related to the risk of cerebral herniation. This is a study in 1999 that showed that patients with cerebral herniation had a much higher uh, mean level of ammonia, 230, uh, versus those patients that did not go on to develop cerebral herniation, where their mean level was 118. And this led to uh, sort of a somewhat arbitrary number of 150, where we start to get really worried about the risk of cerebral herniation. And this is not just at the time that the patient presents to the hospital. This is at any time during their hospitalization. So just checking ammonia level in these patients when they arrive may not be prognostic. Um, and, and we probably should be following ammonia levels and, and uh, using all of the tools that we have to try to prevent cerebral herniation, uh, when, especially when the ammonia levels are very high. Ammonia also is directly related to intracranial hypertension and survival. So on the left, you see that with increasing levels of circulating ammonia, you have uh, a, high, a lower proportion of patients that are free of intracranial hypertension. On the right, you see a decreasing survival in patients with higher levels of ammonia. So going back to this graph, uh, as I said, or, or this picture, there's, there are other ways that the body can detoxify ammonia. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to mention, and as you all know, that the uh, primary way that we manage uh, ammonia in patients both with chronic liver disease and occasionally in patients with uh, acute liver failure is by trying to prevent absorption of ammonia in the gut or from the gut. So we use lactulose and we use rifaximin and sometimes other antibiotics. But once the ammonia is in the circulation, we don't really have any tools to lower ammonia levels. So one of the things that has been tried is a drug called L-ornithine L-aspartate, or LOLA, uh, which is basically a way of providing ornithine to skeletal muscle, which is converted to glutamate uh, by ornithine aminotransferase. And having a glutamate store allows the detoxification of ammonia, again, through normal mechanisms of glutamine synthase, uh, to glutamine. The problem with using LOLA and I should mention LOLA is not available in the United States. But the problem with using LOLA is that although you can produce more glutamine, uh, there's no way to excrete the glutamine. And so what happens is you basically just reform ammonia uh, through the action of glutaminase. And, uh, and the end result is that the patients don't really have a decrease in their ammonia levels or changes in cerebral edema and intracranial hypertension. Another uh, potential treatment uh, is a drug called aminol, which is basically uh, phenylacetate. And phenylacetate combines with glutamine to form uh, a renally excreted compound, PAGN, phenylacetylglutamine. Um, and uh, this is a way to sort of get rid of glutamine so it can't reform ammonia. The problem here is that in patients with chronic liver disease, uh, glutamine levels are actually normal. And so this doesn't seem to have much of an effect. Uh, this is more useful for its indicated, uh, uh, for, for what it's indicated for, which is urea cycle disorders where there are very high levels of glutamine. So, there is a, a new compound that's uh, been developed uh, right now has the name OCR-002. It's an ornithine phenylacetate. It's a combination of ornithine and phenylacetate in a single salt. And this provides ornithine to form uh, glutamate so that you can detoxify ammonia in the circulation. And then the glutamine that results can be renally excreted by co combining with the phenylacetate. So essentially, ornithine phenylacetate uh, acts as an ammonia capture agent. Uh, by acting on two key enzymatic pathways, uh, and these both in combination favor reduction in circulating ammonia. It supplies substrate or glutamate to maintain glutamine formation, and it shifts the glutamate pool to glutamine. And what we see is actually an increase in not only the activity, but also the expression of these uh, of uh, glutamine synthase and a decrease in activity and expression of glutaminase. These are some slides provided by Ocera, the company that makes this drug. Um, and uh, what we can see here on the right is that if you, uh, in sham animals, this is preclinical data, uh, in sham animals on the right, uh, and compared to patients that, or excuse me, animals that are getting either ornithine or phenylacetate alone, you see no difference uh, in their arterial ammonia, whereas on the right, uh, you can see uh, with ornithine phenylacetate, the combination, there is a decrease in ammonia levels um, uh, versus the sham animals uh, over here, which have no increase in ammonia levels. And these ammonia levels also, uh, uh, the decrease in ammonia levels uh, correlates with a decrease in intracranial pressure. So the acute liver failure study group is uh, about to embark on a new clinical trial, uh, which we call the safety and tolerability of ornithine phenylacetate for the treatment of acute liver failure. Oh, that didn't work. <laughs> um, supposed to say stop ALF. Uh, 
There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, the primary objective of this study is to uh, evaluate the safety and tolerability of ornithine phenylacetate in patients with acute liver failure and in severe acute liver injury due to acetaminophen overdose. And we're also interested in uh, pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics of these patients, both in those with intact renal function and also in impaired renal function. And I should mention that uh, the byproduct, the PAGN, is actually dialyzable. So we think that this is going to be safe even in patients with impaired renal function. Uh, and uh, also, we want to look at its effect on venous ammonia levels and on neurologic function. So we're hoping to get started on this in the next couple of months at uh, six sites throughout the country in the acute liver failure study group. And UCSF is one of the primary sites because we've had the highest enrollment of acetaminophen uh, acute liver failure patients for several years now. Okay, so moving on to uh, the third thing I wanted to talk about today, again, coming back to this slide showing you that uh, the complications of acute liver failure are very, uh, are very serious and also uh, variable, and managing all these complications and trying to prevent these complications uh, is very complex. And just like in HCC and really any other critical illness uh, that we deal with in uh, patients with liver disease, uh, really requires a multidisciplinary approach. Um, in this case, with uh, intensivists, surgeons, hepatologists, uh, radiologists, etc. And this is just to, to show you that some of the problems with management of acute liver failure, in addition to being complex, uh, require multiple critical steps. Uh, these steps are not standardized because there are really few controlled studies. And therefore, the management of acute liver failure uh, uh, throughout the country and throughout the world is heterogeneous. And this is despite uh, multiple uh, reviews and, and, uh, and uh, articles that have been written. Uh, we have guidelines for managing acute liver failure. And it's mostly because there's very little data and, and these are based mostly on consensus opinion and, and uh, an expert opinion. So uh, checklists uh, are, in general, uh, something that can decrease human error, standardize a process, reduce variability, improve performance and teamwork, and should be reminders of only the most critical steps of a process and not the steps that practitioners never fail to do. Uh, here's an example of a checklist uh, called engine failure during flight for a single engine Cessna. Um, and and uh, aviation industry is really the, the place where we see checklists used routinely, uh, and not just uh, for routine processes like uh, takeoff and landing, but also in crisis situations such as an engine failure. And what you'll see from here is that the second step here is fly the airplane. And I just got done telling you that uh, you know these checklists should not have things that people f never fail to do. Well, what's interesting, at least in these single engine planes with a, with a single pilot, is that when the engine fails, the pilot often is so focused on trying to get the engine to restart that they forget the most important thing, which is to continue flying the airplane um, because they're able to, to coast and, and uh, they may actually uh, land safely even without the engine restarting. Um, this, this checklist was described in Natul Gawande's The Checklist Manifesto, which really brought to light uh, the use of checklists uh, for, for medical purposes. And here's one early example from 2004 uh, where a checklist uh, for catheter-related bloodstream infections actually had a very significant impact uh, by reducing the baseline uh, incidence of catheter-related bloodstream infections from 11.3 per 1,000 catheter days down to zero per 1,000 catheter days. And this is uh, probably the most widely used uh, checklist. This is, uh, again, from Atul Gawande, published in the New England Journal in 2009, the Surgical Safety Checklist. And this was piloted and then uh, eventually uh, used throughout the world, but initially piloted in eight sites throughout the world. And uh, this re reduced mortality from 1.5% to 0.8% and reduced perioperative complications from 11% to 7%, both very statistically significant. So I think that managing uh, acute liver failure is the ideal process for a checklist. You know, one of the problems is that physicians are generally resistant to using checklists. We think it's kind of an insult to our intelligence. You know, we've been managing acute liver failure or whatever disease you're talking about for years and years, and we know how to do this, and we're very well educated. And this is not as simple, or this is not as you know simple as flying a plane. This is very complex, and uh, there's a lot of judgment that goes into it. And if you use a checklist with you know very set uh, um, uh, criteria, you may actually start to forget to think about what's going on with the patient, and maybe not think outside the box. That is not at all what checklists are meant to be. Checklists are really meant to be. Uh, you know, a list of things that we should never ever forget to do, or at least to force us to think about things that maybe we might forget to think about. Uh, they shouldn't be uh, constraining us to a certain way of managing a patient, but to make sure we don't miss the things that are really, really important. 
we can't forget that you know, we're all prone to human error and memory is faulty. And, and you know, especially in a process of managing patients with acute liver failure, we're going to forget some important things. The other thing that a checklist can do for acute liver failure is to improve, I think, and standardize the management of acute liver failure. So what we've done in the acute liver failure study group is to uh, develop an, a, a checklist that we're about to pilot. Uh, where did we get the information to put in the checklist? Well, there are published guidelines. There are very few randomized or controlled trials in this area, and we have to accept that. Um, so uh, there are published guidelines, and there's a lot of consensus. Um, we relied on expert opinion, primarily within our own group, um, and, and uh, uh, came to, after multiple discussions and iterations, we came to a consensus. Here's what it looks like so far. Um, it, it's long, I agree, it's complex but I think so is managing acute liver failure. Um, there's two parts, and I'm just gonna quickly tell you about what these two parts are. Um, so on the, on, the, on the left, you see what we call the admission and diagnosis uh, acute liver failure checklist. So what this is meant to do is, first of all, for any patient that arrives in the hospital or the ICU, uh, there's things that we need to do no matter what. It doesn't matter what, you know, what state they're in or, or uh, uh, what the etiology of the acute liver failure is. And so this is just to help us to get those things uh, quickly done and not to forget some key elements. Uh, the bottom part of that uh, checklist on the left is a diagnostic checklist uh, to try and remind us of some of the things that might help us to get to a diagnosis quicker and maybe we can lower the, uh, the, the rate of indeterminate uh, etiologies in this group. On the right, you have what's the, called the admission and daily checklist and this is something that uh, first of all gets at the fact that these patients change from day to day or even from minute to minute and so if a new clinical situation arises, we should be able to go to our checklist and, and make sure that we don't forget what we need to do to, to address that. Uh, this is meant to be used not only at the time the patient's admitted, but also on a daily basis and may not apply to every single patient, but at least uh, you'll be thinking about some of the issues that are arising in your patient. There's also two types of checklists in this, uh, in this checklist. Uh, one of them is, is called a do and confirm checklist. So uh, going over to the admission and diagnosis checklist, uh, those were not pencils before, I promise, but uh, anyway, um, the, the, the do and confirm checklist means that you basically read off these items or, or think about these items and make sure that they've been done no matter what. And so, for example, every patient that's admitted with acute liver failure needs to have neuro checks. They should have their head of the bed up. They should have their head in a neutral position. We shouldn't be stimulating them too much. We should be thinking about using IV NAC perhaps in every patient, although I do have an asterisk there because we don't have data for every patient, uh, particularly those in grade three and four encephalopathy. They should be getting uh, monitored for infections, glucose, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And at the bottom of this list is communication. And as I already said, managing these patients uh, really requires a multidisciplinary approach. I think it's true for, for most complex diseases, particularly patients that are in the intensive care unit. But communication is one of the reasons why uh, Atul Gawande thinks that the, safe, safety, uh, the surgical safety checklist was so successful because uh, one of the steps was actually uh, making sure everyone in the operating room introduces themselves. And this gives the nurse, this gives the medical student uh, the power actually to speak up when they see something that's not going right. And this probably was a significant factor in leading to improvements in uh, mortality and in uh, complications. So I think that's also true for acute liver failure. We need to be communicating with intensivists, with surgeons, hepatologists, nurses, and the patient's family, and this is just a reminder to do that. The, the second checklist contains what we call a read and do type of checklist. So again, this may not be applicable to every single patient, but you read the first question, and then you decide based on your patient at that time whether you need to act on that situation. So encephalopathy grade three or four, if yes, you wanna consider mannitol, you want to consider intracranial pressure monitoring. Is there an abrupt change in mental status? If yes, you want to get a CAT scan to rule out intracranial hemorrhage. Is the serum sodium low? You might want to think about hypertonic saline. Are they intubated? If not, you want to avoid sedating medications, but if they are, you want to make sure they're comfortable on propofol or fentanyl, et cetera, et cetera. So as I said, pilot testing is about to begin at eight acute liver failure study sites. Uh, we're going to be surveying uh, users of the checklist for usability and content to improve the, the checklist. Uh, one of the questions that has come up is who's responsible for this checklist. I think that's going to vary from site to site. Uh, at UCSF, it's, it's probably going to be our hepatology fellows because they're always involved in the care of these patients from start to finish. Um, but at other sites, it may be the transplant surgeon, it may be the intensivist, it, uh, it may be the, inten uh, the ICU nurse, and I think it can be a combination of all of these people to, to improve the, 
uh, management of acute liver failure. Um, over time, we're going to uh, look at long-term outcomes using the data that we're collecting already in the acute liver failure study group. Um, so we'll look at process measures. Does this checklist actually improve uh, the, uh, the action of the things that we're telling people to do? Um, and uh, is this going to reduce the proportion of indeterminate etiologies? And I think the holy grail, and, and I'd be very happy if it works, is to uh, show that this checklist can actually improve either spontaneous or overall survival in these patients. So uh, to summarize, uh, I've shown you that a point-of-care dipstick assay for acetaminophen protein addicts can facilitate diagnosis of acetaminophen-related acute liver failure, uh, that ornithine phenylacetate can lower circulating ammonia levels and may improve encephalopathy and intracranial pressure in acute liver failure, and that a checklist can improve and standardize the management of acute liver failure. And uh, this is our logo, and I put my email at the bottom. If you have any questions, I'd welcome them. Thanks for your attention. Great job. Um, all right. Any questions? So um, <clears throat> would you be able to help us fill out the first 10, uh, you know, forms to, for the next? Yeah, I mean, yeah. actually, that's a, it's a good question. I mean, it, it, it does look complex. Uh, the forms are not really meant to be filled out. It's not really something that we want to be part of the medical record. Um, it's not really clear exactly how it's going to be used, and that's part of the pilot testing. Um, but it is something that we want somebody on the team to go through from top to bottom at some point each day. And, and when is, you know, really a question. Is that on rounds? Is it before rounds? Is it in the evening? Those things we're going to have to figure out with pilot testing. But I agree, it's long. We tried to keep it as short as possible. This is as short as we could get it. Marion. So Marion's asking about whether I recommend giving anyone with acute liver failure NAC. So I didn't discuss this because it's not entirely new in acute liver failure, but it is new to a lot of people, I admit. Um, we have a study that was published in 2009 in gastroenterology um, of uh, a clinical trial. It's really the first clinical trial for the acute liver failure study group, and it's one of very few clinical trials, randomized clinical trials in acute liver failure in general, where we randomized NAC, or we randomized patients with acute liver failure that didn't have acetaminophen as their etiology. We randomized them to IV NAC or placebo. And uh, the outcome that we were looking for was overall survival, and unfortunately, we didn't reach that outcome. Um, and so that's sort of a caveat to this study. But uh, in subgroup analysis, we found that in patients that presented with grade one or two encephalopathy, there was a significant uh, survival benefit. And in patients with grade three or four encephalopathy, there wasn't a benefit. Um, and most of those patients in grade three or four encephalopathy reached an outcome, either transplant or death, uh, within about four days of presenting. So our feeling was that either we didn't have enough patients in that group to really see a difference, or it's possible that nothing we do is going to alter their natural history. Um, we don't see a huge downside in using NAC. There are some side effects. There's a, a, a risk of uh, anaphylaxis, which I've never seen. Um, and there's also a risk of, of nausea, uh, which is not that big a deal. Um, and so we think that you know, we should be thinking about using NAC in every patient that presents with acute liver failure, regardless of etiology. I think the, the study of the acetaminophen protein addicts also lends a little weight to that recommendation because there's probably a lot of patients where we don't suspect acetaminophen, and we know that NAC is going to be helpful in those patients no matter when they present, uh, you know, usually within about 72 hours of, of their ingestion. And so uh, we probably could be benefiting a lot of patients if we just put them on NAC uh, no matter what across the board. So that's generally what at least the investigators in the in the uh, or the acute liver failure study group are doing is just putting everybody on NAC. Another question that comes up is whether we should be putting patients with acute liver injury, those are patients without encephalopathy, on NAC, and that that's never been studied. Um, and I know some people in our group that are doing that because they don't see a downside. Um, and we we look at uh, acute liver injury as sort of a, a less severe form of acute liver failure, but really the same process. It's a good question. Thank you. Uh, so the question is, um, you know, most of the data on acute liver failure and ammonia is using arterial ammonia, but clinically we're generally getting venous ammonia. So should we be, I, I think what you're asking is, should we even be checking venous ammonia? Um, so you're right. A lot of the data is on arterial ammonia. The study I, I quoted showing a risk of cerebral herniation with higher levels of ammonia was looking at arterial ammonia. 
Um, and there has been some criticism that venous ammonia is not as accurate as ertil ammonia. Um, but there have been other studies that show that if collected appropriately, and by that I mean it needs to be collected in a cold tube, has to be put on in liquid, uh, not, not ice, but uh, cold liquid, and brought to the lab and run within a half an hour. Um, if that's done appropriately, then the levels of venous ammonia really do correlate with arterial ammonia. If you, if you, draw, the, if you draw the ammonia uh, and then you let it sit on the counter waiting for the phlebotomist or, or transport person to bring it to the lab several hours later, you're going to get lower levels of ammonia for sure because it's a volatile substance. So if you collect it appropriately, hopefully it can be useful. Um, and in the uh, ornithine phenylacetate study, we, we really wrestled with this question. Um, we actually thought about having a central site where we would we'd actually freeze the, the, the serum and then send it to a central site for ammonia measuring. We decided that was just too costly and, and not really practical um, and probably wouldn't get at, at the question that you're asking. And so we're actually going to be collecting venous ammonia at each site and running it at each site individually. And uh, although that's not the primary goal of the, the first part of the study, uh, it's something that we're hoping will show a, a difference. That's right. Oh, so you're saying that my point is that if the venous ammonia is elevated, that is significant, and I agree with that, yes. It, what's more important is if it's low, which, it can, ha which can happen if, you've been, if it's been sitting for a long time, that may not be helpful. But if it's high, then it's definitely helpful. So, so hopefully everybody heard that because I heard it. But uh, um, Phil Rosenthal in the back, who's uh, the principal investigator for the pediatric acute liver failure study group, uh, pointed out that they did a parallel study that, like we did with, uh, with NAC and non-asminophen ALF. And the patients that got NAC in that study, children and adolescents, actually did worse than the patients with placebo. So you're right, the jury is still out about whether we should be giving this to everybody or not. But uh, I can tell you that we're, we're reassured by the adult results, and, and clinically, most of us are using it in pretty much every patient at this point. And I see last question. Oh, are you going to make the checklist available to the community? Yeah, so the, the first step is pilot testing. Um, oh, uh, Dr. Asher is asking if we're going to make the checklist available to the community. I've been keeping it under close wraps uh, because I don't want, uh, before we start to study it, I don't want uh, people to be using it, and then, then we'll miss the, the benefit of the, of the uh, results in, or we'll miss the benefit of the checklist when we actually look at our results. But the goal is definitely to make this available not only to uh, uh, people in the acute liver failure study group, which now is 13 centers throughout the country, but also really any center that's managing acute liver failure. I would caution that I don't think the checklist should be used uh, f by people that are not familiar with managing acute liver failure. This is not, to, not meant to be an algorithm. Uh, it's not meant to be an order set. This is really meant to assist experts in managing acute liver failure, and so it should be used in those settings. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ari, again.